Thank you again for joining us during this special Holy Week. In our last meeting, we discussed about the burial of our Lord at the tomb. This time, we'd like to speak about the Holy Fire. Almost every year, I get asked this question. Is it real? Do we believe in the Holy Fire? And there's many other questions that we can also ask about the shroud. Although I cannot and will not speak as a scientist, but I find that the more that we study both, the more convincing it is that it is true. And for both to remain for centuries and to continue is one of the first testimonies that we can speak of, of their truth. As they say, you can fool some of the people some of the time, but you can't fool many people for centuries. It's very unlikely. It would be a lie that would pass, not only from one patriarch, but from one generation to the next. There are some people, though, that make accusations, and they, there's a lot of skeptics, and for good re reason. There's few things like it that I can think of in any religion, so it's okay to ask questions, but there's a limit to these questions. The first one is that some people argue that it can't happen the same way each year. There's a Russian professor that argued that such a miracle cannot happen every year by our request, since something like that is in the Gospels. And he went on to describe the fire as something of an audacity, blasphemy, and unworthy of the Christian calling to ask God for this to happen. However, as we heard just recently in the Sunday about the paralytic man and the pool of Bethesda, it was an angel of the Lord that was sent each year to heal at a very specific time. It was a regular occurring miracle that was witnessed by all, and it had certain parameters, and when they saw the movement of the water, then they knew that it was time for the healing. So this argument is not legitimate. Other people argue that Christians do this to deceive or trick others. But over centuries, many people have gone to the tomb who are not Christian and witnessed to the truth and became Christian. And there are many even accounts of their martyrdom, and we'll speak about one of those. There are many in Jerusalem that would love for this to be false and that the, the lie of the Christians to be perpetuated for generation to generation, they would love to expose it. Do you think that non-Christians through the centuries wouldn't expose it if it were fake? Believe me, many have tried, and instead of disbelieving, more and more people have come to believe. Now, we don't claim this miracle based on popularity alone, but as our Lord said, you can judge them by their fruits. So in this session, we'll speak about some of the fruits. There's a very long history according to the Holy Fire. I will only go through a few of them. The historian Eusebius writes in his life of Constantine, which dates from about 328, an interesting occurrence that happened in Jerusalem, the Feast of Resurrection of the year 162 AD, although some people say it happened a little bit late. The bishop of Jerusalem at the time was Bishop Narcissus. He was the 13th patriarch of Jerusalem. And when he was preparing for the Feast of the Resurrection and the vigil, the lamps ran out of oil, and he had no time to refuel them. He asked for containers of water, sent, and he prayed over them, and then after a great petition, he had his attendants fill the lamps with water instead of oil. And of course, uh, they were lit one by one, which was a great uh, account of his uh, piety and his uh, miraculous works. There are many accounts like this. This is just one of them that's mentioned in his life. There were many people who conspired against him, which eventually led to his martyrdom in 116 AD. But he is considered a saint in all of the apostolic churches. We commemorate him on the first of Baruchat, which is March 9th or 10th, depending on the uh, leap year. And also he's commemorated in Catholic Church as well as the Eastern Orthodox Church. Eusebius also mentions another account in his life of Constantine. He said that Constantine was so zealous about the celebration of the resurrection that he changed the holy night vigil so that instead of it being dark, it became very bright. This event does not really speak about the holy fire, but it mentions that how much that he lit torches everywhere diffused their light so as to impart to this mystic vigil a brilliant splendor beyond that of the day. So he said that it was even greater than the daytime. We'll also see that there's more evidence of this in about a couple centuries. Around the year 385, Egeria, a noble woman from Spain, and some believe that she was a nun, she went to Palestine and to Jerusalem, and she recorded her accounts in a, her famous journal. 
Now, in the account of her journey, she speaks about a ceremony in the Holy Anastasis, in which the lamps of the church were lit from a cave, which is always lit. Now, she doesn't speak again in detail about the ceremony, but she mentions here the timing and that all of the candles uh, are lit from the light of the uh, tomb of our Lord. And she said it's such a great light that, um, that it is brought from inside the cave and inside the enclosure, and that light is always uh, lit night and day. Now, in the ninth century is the first very clear depiction and description of the Holy Fire by Bernard the Wise uh, in the year 867 approximately. He went everywhere and traveled as a pilgrim and wrote his itinerary, which is still today. He even went to, to Egypt, and in many of the monasteries, you'll see much of his graffiti that is engraved on the wall. In this account here, we see that the angel, he says, <clears throat> that surrounded four or nine of nine columns in the front of the actual tomb, and then uh, it, it surrounds the stone, which is actually the original cave of the resurrection. And it's placed by the tomb which the angel rolls back, and on which he sat after the Lord had risen. Now he wrote, uh, then later on, he's saying what, what mentions on Holy Saturday, uh, on the vigil of Easter, in the morning the office begins in the church, and then when it is over, they, they go and sing in Kirelaison, until the angel comes and kindles the light in the lamps which hang above the sepulchre. The patriarch passes some of the light to the bishops, and then the rest of the people, and each one has light where he is standing. There's also a similar account that's about a hundred years later by Metropolitan Arethas, who says the same thing. He says that after they cried in the Anastasis Kirileison, there was a sudden flash of lamp, uh, the lamp light, and again, all the inhabitants of Jerusalem take from this light and they light their flame. And we will see in a little bit many of these videos in which you see the same flash of light and the same light coming from the tomb, and sometimes around the tomb. The last historical account we'll look at is from the Russian abbot Daniel, who visited Jerusalem from 1106 to 1107, and he describes the descent of the Holy Fire as it was uh, celebrated during the 12th century. And as you see here, I know there's a lot of text, but he goes step by step, and he mentions here that a large number of people were outside, when he arrived, the doors were open for him because he was uh, with uh, in, in this glorious celebration. And then they say, uh, Lord, have mercy on us. And then they enter into the building, uh, and the people were weeping with tears uh, when the, for this uh, holy light to come. He entered with Prince Baldwin, uh, and this uh, shows us one of the first accounts, too, of the emperor of the, and the great leaders that are attending these events. Then he continues to say that uh, the, the prince is now responsible to seal with the royal seal the sepulcher after they have removed everything from the tomb. And he mentions even the time they start to chant vespers and then they read some of the readings and then the people begin to cry out Kriyalaison, just like we heard in the other accounts. Now, the most interesting part comes here. He said, at the end of the ninth hour, when they begin to sing the, the, the passage, then a small cloud coming from the east suddenly came to rest over the open dome of the church, and a light rain fell upon the holy sepulchre and upon us who were above the tomb. And it was like that holy light suddenly illumined the holy sepulchre, stunningly bright and splendid. The bishop, followed by four deacons, then opened the doors of the holy sepulchre and went with the candles and taken from Prince Baldwin and the first to be lit from the holy fire. So he, he actually says that even the bishop in this time didn't go in, that the people were outside and praying and weeping, saying, Kriyalaison, and the holy fire came. Then the bishop went in and took from the fire. Then he says, and describes the fire, which is a little bit different than what we will see uh, in modern times. 
He says that there is an indescribable brightness and with the red color, the likes of cinnamon. That's all the people that stood with lit candles in their hands and repeatedly loudly with excitement, Lord have mercy on us. And someone who has not shared in the excitement of that day cannot possibly believe that all that I saw is true. So he said, there's a great excitement and also unbelievable even with people who haven't experienced this. But there are two specific historical accounts that I would like to focus on. When you come to investigate this, you'll find hundreds of accounts from people all over different countries and languages and centuries. But these two, I think, are among the most relevant for us. The first one comes in 1579. It's mentioned in the Chronicles of the Patriarchate of Jerusalem. And according to this, the Turkish governors forbade the Greek Patriarch, at the time his name is Sophronius IV, and the Orthodox faithful to enter the Church of the Resurrection. And it was cus the customary rite of the Holy Fire. Some say that this was because the Armenians had bribed the Sultan so that the Armenian Patriarch would enter. The Chronicle mentions that there were four Patriarchs present. Patriarch Sophronius IV, who was just ordained, this is his first year that he celebrates uh, the, the Feast of Resurrection in Jerusalem. Then Patriarch Jeremiah of Constantinople, and then the Greek Orthodox Patriarch Sylvester of Alexandria, as well as the Patriarch Joachim of Antioch. Interestingly, the Armenian Patriarch is not mentioned, even though that it's customary later for the Armenian Patriarch to enter also with the Greek Orthodox Patriarch of Alexandria. The Sultan of the Ottoman Empire at that time was Murad III. And we can verify from this description that all of these people present, as you see on, on the screen, all of these people were uh, in their, uh, their uh, patriarchate or in their time of authority in 1579. So it does seem that the Turks had deprived the newly ordained patriarch from entering into the tomb. The patriarch instead stood in the corner of the church near a column and prayed. And it is said that the holy fire came on the candles that he was holding and broke the column that he was standing next to. <laughs> now, a few years later, on November 20th in 1583, there was a council held by Constantinople, which mentions the same patriarchs, all of them except for Patriarch Joachim of Antioch. I don't know if he was not live or not invited to this council, but at least we have another event where all of these hierarchs are mentioned, and all of their names are memorialized in the declaration of this council at Constantinople. Now, there's a Codex 346 which contains uh, the Proskinitarium of the priest Ananios. And this is the description that we get the details from. Uh, it was written in 1608, about 29 years after the miracle, which means that he was able to collect the information from the individuals who actually experienced the event. This church account, as you see, was published in Vienna in 1749 by someone called Simeon, and we have many accounts of it, so uh, that we have the original from 1608, and then afterwards, uh, and then finally we have um, from the uh, Ananias uh, name. One of the Arab princes who saw this confessed his faith in Christ, and he was marked. His name was Tumor. And it's portrayed in this icon here in the Greek Orthodox Church of Jerusalem, standing next to the pillar of fire. And, and it is believed that after he confessed his faith, he was actually killed and martyred. He's commemorated in the Eastern Orthodox Church on April 18. This column, which still exists today, if you are going to visit Jerusalem, as you enter into the Holy Anastasis, on your left, you'll see this famous marble column. Now you'll notice from this uh, modern picture that the fissure of the marble column is about four feet high and it resembles a flame. And you'll notice uh, that this is very unique, so when you're passing by, it's the only one that looks like it in the entire place. The second event happened in 1832 with our patriarch Pope Peter VII, also known as Abba Butrus and Gavri, the 109th patriarch who departed on April 5th 1852. There's an event that's commemorated in our own Synexarium on the 28th of Baramhat, which we just had read a couple weeks ago. Now, the Synexar entry 
recounts many of the miracles and wonders of this Blessed Father, and among them is the account when he was asked to go to the Holy Anastasis uh, as uh, accompanying Ibrahim Basha. Now, <clears throat> this it's, it's, it says that he was doubting the, the fire, the Holy Fire, and also Ambabutros, he wanted to verify the truth of what he had heard. So both of them took this journey to the Holy Sepulchre on the Feast of the Resurrection, and it is said that they both witnessed the Holy Fire, and it proved the, the validity of the appearance of the Holy Light. Then they returned to Cairo with great honor. So this tells us that even our own cynic star is recounting the truth of the Holy Fire. An older cynic star entry, which is not as accurate, um, speaks about the pillar being split, and it's a, some type of confusion with the last cynic star entry, uh, or the last account that we had just mentioned. And so that's why it was a bridge in the modern cynic star. Now let's turn to some of the events that take place. There are six apostolic churches in the Holy Anastasis. The Greek Orthodox Church, which uh, now have the ownership uh, of the, the, uh, the, the church, the cathedral, the Franciscans, Armenian Orthodox, the Coptic Orthodox, the Syrian Orthodox, and the Ethiopian Orthodox churches. Now by tradition, the Greek and Armenian bishops uh, used to enter the tomb alone, and now it seems it's mainly the Greek Orthodox with an assistant, and then they emerge divinely with the lit flame. All of the denominations are present, including the Coptic Orthodox. Here you have a picture of His Eminence Metropolitan Abraham of blessed memory, who used to attend. And as we know from year to year, it's one of the most important and significant days which the patriarchs must attend. There are representatives also from the Armenian and Ethiopian that are gathered around the tomb while it is closed and sealed. Then, as you see here in this video, the Patriarch of Jerusalem will arrive to the, the Holy Anastasis. And he is taken in a very special procession. And after he arrives, as you see, he will start to take off his vestments one by one, which is given to the attendant, <clears throat> so that he can go in without any uh, thing. Because uh, the Muslims, when they were in charge, thought that they were possibly uh, taking in a candle or taking in some lighter that would uh, be able to do this. So he is searched and he takes off all of his vestments except for the holy, uh, the tunia, the white vestment, the simple white vestment, just like the boy was buried with the shroud. And then they give him the candles, as you see here, uh, so that he could light from the fire. It used to be the Armenian patriarch, but it still looks like after him will only come the, this uh, deacon with the uh, hat or archmandrite, I'm not sure. And then they will seal the two, those, the, the Armenian and the Greek, uh, you can't really see, but they will seal the tomb to make sure that nobody else can enter inside. Um, and this seal, after they're finished, it will look a little bit like this. Uh, so this a picture, you see the Armenian uh, and the Greek as well uh, participating in the seal of the tomb. Now this ancient tradition uh, is, is uh, probably dating back to the Muslim doubts, but as we heard in the accounts before, that there were also uh, sealing of the tomb before the holy fire comes, and then the crowd waits. Now what happens inside? It's very difficult, I don't believe there's any clear footage of what happens, but there is a description here from Patriarch Theodorus, who was Patriarch of Jerusalem from 1981 to 2000. Now, in a very unique and special interview, he explains what happens, so uh, we have included it here. He says, I enter the tomb and kneel in holy fear in front of the place where Christ lay after his death, and where he rose again from the dead. I find my way through the darkness toward the inner chamber, in which I fall on my knees. I say certain prayers that have been handed down to us through the centuries, and having said them, I wait. Sometimes I may wait a few minutes, but normally the miracle happens immediately after I have said the prayers. From the core of the very stone which Jesus laid, an indefinable life force forth. It usually has a blue tint, 
but the color may change and take many different hues. It cannot be described in human terms. The light rises out of the stone as mist may rise out of a lake. It almost looks as if the stone is covered by a mist cloud, but it is light. This light, each year behaves differently. Sometimes it covers just the stone, while others it gives light to the whole sepulchre, so that the people who stand outside the tomb and look into it will see it filled with light. The light does not burn. I have never had my beard burnt in all the 16 years I have been patriarch of Jerusalem, and I have received the holy fire. The light is of a different consistency than normal fire that burns in an oil lamp. Then he continues to say, at a certain point, the light rises and forms a column in which the fire is of a different nature, so that I am able to light my candles from it. And when I thus have received the flame on my candles, I go out and give the fire, first to the Armenian patriarch, then to the Coptic. Hereafter, I give the flame to all the people present in the church. <clears throat> when the light is received, it passes through two windows from the north and the south. It's usually very difficult to see, and we'll show a brief video, but it's, it's, it will have, need more explanation. Then the fire is shared from candle to candle, as you see here briefly, with the man who's holding the, the torch, and the people next to the sepulchre think they have the flame. Within minutes, the entire place is lit, as you will see with this uh, Finally, the patriarch comes out with the two candles from the western door. As you know, that was the door that was sealed. And as you saw in the video, many people run out before he actually uh, gets there. The ancient custom was that he lights everyone else's. Now, this was replicated in other churches, as we will see in a little bit. <clears throat> so let's turn to this video, where you can try to see very briefly, there's always crowds uh, that's uh, circulating. But you can see here, the patriarch now is coming from the west of the tomb, and he will cross the two candles, with each one of them is bound with 33 small candles. And when the light is received, then it is passed also uh, to the other people. Now he will, uh, he will give it now to the, to the patriarch, and the people, of course, are trying to take uh, from him as well. And sometimes you'll think that the flashes are from cameras, uh, but a lot of those flashes, probably the majority, are not from uh, cameras at all. They are from the light itself that starts to fill in the, the church. The people, of course, with jubilant uh, excitement, uh, they will continue uh, like this for uh, minutes, you know, hours, and then they begin the Vespers prayer or the evening prayer for the feast. The fire, as we said, it goes throughout the entire city very quickly, not just in the tomb. There are runners that go out. In some of the videos, you may see it even running before the patron uh, outside into the city. Now, while the fire is focused on the patron and the time that he enters to offer the prayers, the holy fire is not limited to him and what happens in the tomb, as we heard in, in history. Amazingly, light is report reported to appear around above the tomb, which is usually of a blue hue, but not always blue. Some people even see a cloud of fire orbiting the anastasis. In the bottom left picture here, you will see uh, a flame of light that's on the side of the church, and sometimes it appears like this. Very often, a cloud or flashes of light ignite the candles of others on its own. As you see in the top left picture, sometimes the people on the second floor get the light before the people Below. Even many of the oil lamps in the church are lit by themselves before the pilgrims. So many people who witness all of these events uh, leave Jerusalem very changed and they have a testimony about this. Now here's a picture of the blue light that was moving in various places throughout the church. You'll notice that it's coming from the side of the church. And it's true that every year it is very distinct and unpredictable, just like we heard the patriarch mention in color and its movement. In a similar way, when the Holy Virgin Mary was appearing in Zaytun, each night was distinct from the other. Sometimes she appeared in words, sometimes she was alone, sometimes she was carrying the Lord. Uh, they couldn't predict exactly how she will appear or exactly how long she will stay. It was very unique every day. 
Here's another picture of that mysterious light. Now it's distinct from the other lights that you see. Someone would say this is the light coming from outside, but we already see some windows that are open and the light is coming in with obligation. But this blue light is very different. Now, don't listen to me, I have never attended the celebration, but you, if you listen to the various experiences of the people who have attended, they will be able to tell you. One witness I spoke to who went in one year, I believe it was in 2015, told me that, that it was we were holding the candles and many people on the second floor had it before us and uh, not everyone lit the candles. We looked and we found people's uh, flames, people's candles being brightened by itself. One of the other unique things as well is that the fire doesn't burn people's hair or faces or hands, just like the patriarch had mentioned. The amount of people who have tested this is uncountable. Uh, some people say that it takes, that this happens in the first 33 minutes. Other people say it's a little less, 20 minutes. But most impressive is the fact that these people with the candles don't burn each other accidentally. I mean, one flame alone could be enough to start an amazing fire that could harm the whole place. Um, so also the time that it takes for, to reach all these people is incredibly fast. These are just some of the pictures of the people so, who have demonstrated this, so we won't have to go in detail. There's even a man in this picture, he looks like a cleric in, in the video, uh, that uh, shows that it, it, uh, it's not burning his beard, it will start with his beard, and then he'll put it on his hand. And uh, in an amazing way, he posted this video to convince people that it's not a fake uh, event, but it's actually a very true thing. Like I said, we have to do these things relatively quickly, because after 20 minutes or so, it will have a normal uh, fire. One archaeologist, Archpriest Gennady Zaridze of uh, the Russian Association of Orthodox Scientists, he studied the flame of the holy fire and compared it to a regular flame. Now he used an infrared pyrometer and calculated the flame of the holy fire, as you see he compared to one regular flame and the flame from the fire, in the first few minutes was 42 degrees Celsius. But after 15 minutes, that same flame reached a temperature of 320 degrees Celsius, which was similar to the flame next to it. The regular flame remained constant. Now, his results are published in this journal, as you see uh, on the screen. He then placed two types of fabric above the candles, after 10 minutes and after 11 minutes from the fire, each one for about 30 seconds. Now, you can tell the normal one, and both of them burned the fabric. The other one didn't. You can even see that the one in 10 minutes, which is above, is a little bit less uh, intense than the one afterwards. So the holy fire seemed to have been increasing in its natural properties as fire. So there's much to be said, but I want to focus on our Coptic Orthodox liturgical tradition. The Paschal services are very unique, and we find them that there is, in some way, each of the churches have taken this practice uh, and incorporated it into their service for Holy Resurrection. The Armenian Patriarch, as you will see in this video, enters with the Greek Orthodox Patriarch, or is one of the first. Um, so afterwards, they have special services in which they almost always have candles in their hand during the service in every church. And it's in remembrance of what happens uh, in the Holy Fire. As I said, because they are among the closest to the Greek Orthodox Patriarch. There's also uh, different traditions uh, in, in different places that take place. So in the Greek Orthodox Church, they started a tradition of taking the fire to Greece. Um, and when they did this, because as I said, they are responsible <coughs> for the prayers and for the account, they advanced. This ceremony, which usually took place in the evening, as we heard in the accounts in the 4th century and 10th century and 11th century, that this was right before the Vespers prayer. Now it's in the afternoon time, about 1, 2, 3 p.m. Um, and it was done also with, with uh, enough time for them 
to take this fire in the lantern, as you see here, to Greece in time for the feast. And then they will start the, the evening prayers for the Feast of Resurrection. And there's a special flight on Aegean that was designated for this purpose a number of years ago. And now I believe there are about 10 flights that are chartered each year to various destinations. Of course, this year it will be a little bit less because of the circumstances. Very much like Greece, uh, lanterns are also taken to Russia in a chartered plane. Now what you see here is uh, they will take the flame. Uh, from uh, Greece, sorry, from Jerusalem to Moscow. And then afterwards, they will go straight to the Cathedral of Christ the Savior, where Patriarch Kirill, as you see here, leads the service. And he is dressed in all white vestments, which is typical for the Russian Orthodox Church on the Feast of Holy Resurrection. And after a brief, brief explanation, he will take here uh, two candles in his hands, and then the attendant who is responsible for the fire who came from Jerusalem will light uh, the candle of the patriarch, as you uh, see here. Um, and then they will take this flame, people will light from it as well. He will bless the people, as you see here, with uh, the flame. And then they will begin to process uh, and the procession for the Feast of the Resurrection. After the deacon has taken this, then they will exit the church start uh, they will start the prayers and this similar tradition as you will see is found in many other churches here's you know, the procession that will take place uh, in uh, Russia <clears throat> we as you recall this was done at the door of the altar just as the patriarch of Jerusalem blessed the congregation with the fire at the door of the altar in the Anastasis after he received the fire and we do the very same thing when we turn off the lights in the church, and we will stand at the door of the altar with a candle, or sometimes two candles. Now the Catholic, or the Catholic Church does it a little bit differently. Each year during the Catholic vigil, uh, the service is on Holy Saturday, a fire is kindled in a metal bowl called the Brajur. From this comes the new and blessed fire, which that's what it means, that lights the Paschal candle, um, and that is carried into a procession in the church, which is dark. Then the new fire, once it is lit, then all of the church becomes enlightened, and they turn on all of the lamps and the lights. You will see here a brief video of this year's celebration of the Catholic Church. Um, actually, sorry, this one, this video is uh, done as an illustration of how they light the fire after they say some prayers. They will go outside of the church and they will light this uh, flame, Brazil. And then they will read some more prayers and then light the candle, which uh, the attendant or the deacon is holding behind the priest, and then they will enter into the church. Now let's see what they did in the Vatican this year, which again begins with a late night procession uh, into the church. Here we will find that the fire was already burning. So they already did the first prayers. And then the Pope will come, he is holding the Paschal candle, and he will uh, enter um, and go to where the brochure is in the church, and then he will light uh, from that, that place. Um, then there is a procession that will continue, and there's a series of prayers uh, that are made. Here the Pope is taking the light, and then he will go after he takes the light into procession. After this time, then they will add five spoons of incense or grains of incense that are offered to remind us of the aromatic spices that were used to prepare the body of the Lord for burial. These represent the five wounds, but even in our church, we have the five spoons of incense, the same, uh, that remind us of the five sacrifices in the Old Testament. So the five sacrifices in the Old Testament point to the wounds of the Lord in the New Testament, and they are offered on the altar every time. So this special procession is the way that it is done in the Catholic Church. The candle represents Christ himself, who is the light of the world. They will keep this candle on the altar all of the 50 days until the Feast of Pentecost. 
So this is a, a couple of pictures of what the Paschal candle looks like in detail. And as you will see, uh, they sell them every year, but they write the date of the, the feast so that you know that this candle belongs to the feast of the resurrection year 2020 so that they don't repeat uh, the same candle. It's only to be lit at one time. Now let's turn to our Coptic Orthodox Church. And much of what we do is related to what happens in the tomb. Um, uh, the, while we pray, this picture was taken while we prayed at midnight solemnly in the church. And as you see, it was when we start praying very uh, late at night or early in the morning, the church is completely dark. They light all the lamps and the candles. This is on a typical Sunday until the, the light increases and then we start the divine liturgy. Um, you will also look that this theme of light in the Gospel of John is one of the most important themes that we'll see even in the Holy 50 Days and in the Gospels that are chosen on the Sunday Gospels for the Feast. We turn off the lights, as you know, and replicate what happens in Jerusalem in a different way. The first thing they do is they take the icon of the burial out from where it is placed. And uh, I think it is clear for you why we turn off the lights. In the Holy Anastasis, also the lights are extinguished to prepare for the light of Christ. While we were sitting in darkness in the shadow of death, you, O Lord, came to the world and you brought life to all. You are the light of everyone who comes into the world. But some people will ask, why do we place it on the right side of the altar? Well, if you look, uh, the, in the middle of the altar is where the Lord um, is actually uh, to be buried. Um, this here is a picture of the western entrance where the churches pray. This is where we saw the patriarch of Jerusalem coming out and lit with candles. Um, conveniently, it's completely em empty. It has just been renovated, actually, for this year. Uh, they did uh, for several months uh, renovating the church, so it looks different now if you were to go then if you were in the past uh, maybe 100 years. This leads to the outer chamber, so that door leads to the outer chamber, which we spoke about last time, and then there's an inner chamber where the body of the Lord was. That's why this is a very large, it is a very large cave, uh, and many people are gathered around it. On the opposite of this side is the Coptic Orthodox altar, which you see here. Now, I remember the first time I had the opportunity to go, which was for a, uh, a course, a graduate course that was there. Uh, the joy that you have in seeing this place, it's almost as a dream. And this is where the Coptic Orthodox Church prays every week. As we say, said, this is the only altar that faces east. All of the other ones uh, face in different directions. Um, and the other churches pray on the other side of the tomb that we just saw, which is facing west. For some reason, Constantine had built the famous church, this one as well, as in the Church of Antiquity facing west. And the same thing for the church in Rome, in the Vatican, it was facing west. But we're grateful for one thing, that we are very close to the altar, maybe even closer than anyone else facing because there's that large outer room that we just spoke about. Now let's look a little bit closer at our church. If you look below where the arrow is, beneath the altar, there is what looks like a shelf. Now this is not a normal shelf. It goes directly into the tomb where the body of the Lord was laid. And this was the side where the Lord's head was, because the Lord, they were buried as custom, facing east, with the hope of the resurrection, because it was said that the Lord is coming from the east. <clears throat> so actually, when we pray the divine liturgy, the priest is praying immediately above where the Lord's head lay, and the body and blood are there. So when we pray that this is the altar, we have in front of us where the head of the Lord was, and of course we have the chalice where the body and blood is. Because we are praying on bright Saturday, the feast, so we cannot take this place, so we put onto the right of the altar uh, this icon of the burial of the Lord. Now, if the altar is not consecrated, we put a holy board that is in the same direction that is covering usually the, the, the underneath the body.
body and the blood. And as you will very clearly understand that this board, this altar board, is exactly like that marble slab in which the Lord was laid. Um, so when you see it, we will also put, as we saw last time, two candles, which will represent not only the candles that you see here on the altar, but they represent for us the windows in which we receive the light on both places uh, of the altar. So where the Lord is laying, it is full of light. It also reminds us, as we said, of the angels that were seen at the head and at the feet of the Lord, where the Lord had laid. You will notice also, also that the altar is always lit with many candles. This is unique for our church. Many people love to light a candle here, even under, because there's very few places close to the tomb that you can do this. And when you enter into the tomb, there are lamps uh, that are always burning, just like we heard from the jury from the 4th century, and this practice is continued. Uh, but if you wanted to light a lamp it is, or a candle, you can't do so in the tomb. The closest that you have is in the Coptic Orthodox altar. Uh, people come from all over the world with candles to light once from this tomb. And sometimes they will also have a candle, such as this one, and this one, that it replicates what the uh, patriarch of Jerusalem does. If you look here, you'll find that there are 33, and they're bound with a, a little rubber band or a rope uh, to replicate what happens. And people will go and light from the flame that is always burning. There's one on the side, a lampstand. Uh, and so as you see, these will burn. So they light from it, and then they take it home as a blessing, as a memorial that they went and took the blessing from the tomb. <clears throat> so the lamps, like we said, are always burning there. Um, in the church, we commemorate this by lighting every candle and every that is un next to every icon from the icon of the Lord that is behind the altar. Now, the windows we spoke about are very important. And you will see in this video why. You see that there will be a light that is coming very dimly uh, from these windows. And although many people are trying to take a picture, because this is where the light first leaves, before the patriarch leaves, he lights uh, from, uh, as you see that attendant, it's going to be very hard to see, he will send a light from this window first. And the people are gathered around so they can take from this, as you see here, and then they will go and run and share it with everyone. <clears throat> this uh, is the tradition uh, about these windows. The priest then will go and offer incense in these two windows, as we will see a little bit uh, in, in a moment. Then the patriarch, as we saw earlier, comes out from the western door. Now this is what the windows look like. Uh, from the side without people, uh, too many people gathered around, as you saw in the video. Uh, this is another picture from the other side, and you can see that the one on the left, you can actually, it goes into uh, the, the tomb itself. Um, so, and then all the way on the left, you will find is the Coptic altar. So again, uh, the flame that we receive is before. Now, as we mentioned, that uh, what we do in every liturgy, especially in the Holy 50 Days, that we will go in procession around uh, from our altar, as you see in the background of this, this picture on the right, that's where our altar is. We will take a procession and we will go to the two windows and offer incense in every Vespers and in every liturgy. Um, I wish I had better pictures, but these are the ones uh, that, that uh, I was able to, to find. Then we will offer incense, as we see here, to those two windows, and then return back to the altar. Now here's a brief video, but unfortunately, the one who took uh, this, this, this video is of the procession. Uh, that is roughly done. This is the one for Vespers. That's done around uh, the um, altar. And then we'll go, uh, although we don't do so, in the Vespers in, in the exact same way, but some for the great feasts, we will go around the church, uh, and as you'll see, the blessing uh, of the incense as well as the lights uh, is there. Many people will, 
give and go in these processions lit with candles, as you see with the priests and the other people continuing uh, with, uh, with the candles in procession. Um, and so this is essential, especially in the holy days. Now in the Divine Liturgy, we can also play this video, which it happens a little bit differently. During the Pauline and, and the Acts, uh, there is a procession that we will say uh, for uh, with Christosinisti. Now, again, I apologize for this video. Uh, you mainly will see the deacons, but what we are doing <laughs> is that we will process around the church uh, during Christosinisti. We are not able, unfortunately, in the anastasis, we don't have the permission to go completely around the altar. So we will only go to the sides where the flame comes out, and then we'll return again to the other side. And this is a commemoration of what the people were doing on the, the bright Saturday. And that's why we call it bright Saturday, because the church, which was, has seen this marvelous light that is coming uh, from the Lord. Uh, so this is part of the worship. Now, unfortunately, the coronavirus has affected even this tradition that we've had for centuries. And this year, only 10 people will be able to attend, two of them as soldiers and one representative from every church. <laughs> so uh, the, they will continue to celebrate, uh, but it's very different and very difficult, even in the holies, in most holy places. Instead, unfortunately, the feast will look a little bit like this for the Catholics, and even for the Orthodox, the doors of the church will be closed. We have hope that God will use the light of the resurrection to bring joy and hope to his people once again. As we always pray, Lord, keep the doors of your church open to the believers. Give joy, give us the joy of the holy resurrection so that we can spread the light of your life around the world. Glory be to you now and